Well, 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 what do we have here? I see we have an adorable little princess that needs some candy in her bag. Oh, along with a spooky ghost. Oh, and a creepy zombie. And what do we have here? Wait a minute. Is that the funeral mask formerly known as First Century Mark? <laughs> Dan Wallace, you sly devil, tried to trick me again. <laughs> Just like in our debate, but I gotcha. Good try, though, buddy old pal. <laughs> There's no fooling you, Dr. Airman. You got me. <laughs> and this must be James White dressed up as the original inerrant text. <laughs> I see you finally pieced it all together, James. <laughs> ha ha ha. Well, my actual costume is the Nestle Allen 29th edition of the original inerrant text. And with the breakthrough of the CBGM, I'll be able to recreate a new costume version of the original text every year that I can wear. So how about them apples? Anyway, let's get ready to go bike riding as we planned, before it gets too late. James White, you've got to come back with me. Where? Back to the future. No, 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 Stewie. Dr. Ehrman and Dan Wallace are here, and I can't leave them behind. We were just getting ready to take our bikes out for a spin. There's no need for them. This concerns you, James. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? What happens to me in the future? Does YouTube cancel the dividing line or something? No, no, James. Both you and the show turn out fine. I, I think... It's the text of the New Testament, James. Something's got to be done about the text. Well, uh, what happens to the text? Hello? Hello, anybody home? Hey, think, James White, think. The obvious question is what's been happening to the text under the guise of modern critical text theory. But just me telling you a little bit about the future of the text will cause a chain reaction of events that will create an entire new timeline. Now off of your bike. The game is afoot. Hey, Stewie, we better back up. We don't have enough road to get up to 88. Roads? Well, where we're going, we don't need roads. Where are we headed, Stewie? Ah, I'm glad you asked, James. Well, in order to help you grasp the future of modern New Testament textual criticism, you must first understand its past. Basically, how did we get into this mess that we are currently in, which has mucked everything up? Mess? Ah, I see that the postmodern narrative that modern text critics have been spewing since the late 18th century has deluded your senses, James. Things will clear up soon. But more on that later. By the way, James, I think it's really cool that we're hanging out together. I'm a big fan. I'm absolutely cuckoo for the Dividing Line show. But, James, when I watch your segments on New Testament textual criticism, you tend to avoid the real issue. What do you mean, Stewie? Oh, don't play dumb, James. You sidestep the real issue by talking about the comma of John and Revelation 16.5. Really, one word, James? Like that's the problem? And let's not forget how much you love talking about the medieval manuscripts used by Erasmus. Ugh, such trivial matters. When will you learn, James? It's not about the TR, but the text of Antioch. And it's at Antioch where we begin our journey. Antioch? Great Scott! To infinity and beyond, and beyond. Oh, 
Actually, our James, where it all began, Ground Zero, where Hort first launched his attack in 1881 with the introduction of his theory on the text of Antioch. The, 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 the text of Antioch? Oh, how you cringe at the very words, James. Surely I can see your reluctance to share such information on the dividing line, having to explain to your sycophants why the biblical text preached on from Antioch by John Chrysostom in 385 AD, from the oldest surviving church going back to the apostles, was secondary in origin and did not represent the type of text used in the 2nd and 3rd centuries by the Greek Orthodox churches and that for the next 1,500 years, the Greek, Latin, and Aramaic apostolic churches were using the wrong type of text. Wrong text? Where do I get the correct text? I'm sorry to tell you this, man, but according to James White, you'll have to wait until 1881 until the correct one is published, and then subscribe for the yearly updates. Remember, James, Dr. Gordon Fee also saw the problem the text of Antioch posed to modern textual theories and attacked it as well in his response to Hodges and Picking, asserting Chrysostom's text is still closer to the majority text than it is to any text of the 2nd or 3rd century. Ha! Like Gordon Fee actually had 2nd and 3rd century text from the official Greek Orthodox churches to base that statement on. But back to the matter at hand. Don't you see, James, why Hort, who truly understood the issue, had to devise his Lucan recession theory, which would not only explain away the text at Antioch, but would also, in turn, nullify the commonly received text of the Apostolic Church's testimony by relegating thousands of independent witnesses down to essentially one. Accordingly, in the face of the extant manuscript testimony, Hort stated, The natural presumption would be that a majority of extant documents is more likely to represent a majority of ancestral documents at each stage of transmission than vice versa. But Stewie, no bona fide textual scholar holds to Hort's Lucan conflation theory any longer? Except maybe Daniel Wallace, but don't tell I told you. But you're still holding to Holt's conclusion, James, on the commonly received text of the apostolic churches, even though all his premises have been falsified. Haven't you read Neville Birdsall's published study that has had major implications for this school of thought? Look right here, James. Read along with me, or better yet, eat some cake while I read it to you. Since the publication of Hort's introduction in 1881, it has been assumed in most quarters, as the handbooks reflect, that the text was uniform from the time of John Chrysostom, and that this uniform text, called by a variety of names, and here Byzantine, is to be found in his quotations. However, more recent investigations has questioned both the uniformity of the Byzantine text and its occurrence in Chrysostom citations. Birdsall concluded, in referring to his own work, Hort's premises in the works of Lake, Lagrange, Colwell, and Streeter, that it is evident all presuppositions concerning the Byzantine text or texts, except its inferiority to other types, must be doubted and investigated de novo. Who maintains their conclusions when the hypothesis continues to fail? What kind of science is this, James? Don't you see what's happened, James? Hort brought in the German rationalism of the late 18th century into the church with his introduction in 1881, thus moving textual science off the ecclesiastical texts for texts of unknown provenance, which has in turn altered the philosophy of New Testament textual criticism for the last 150 years. For while textual criticism has always been a part of church history, as seen in the biblical scholarship of Jerome, Thomas of Harkel, Cardinal Jimenez, and others, they always use ecclesiastical texts. But Hort changed that by accusing the Greek Orthodox of conflating their texts, when in fact it was Hort who actually conflated the texts by creating his textual Frankenstein, basically comprised of Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Codes Beza, thereby introducing into the church a text that cannot be shown to have ever been used in any apostolic church prior to 1881. This was the break that interfered with the time-space continuum for the text of the New Testament, James. It's all becoming perfectly clear, James. There was never any standardized text within the Greek Orthodox churches until the publication of its patriarchal text in 1904. 
which means that the overwhelming proportion of variants common to the great mass of cursive manuscripts of the New Testament are basically independent witnesses, not based on a uniform text that became popular at Antioch in 385, or collusion by the great Orthodox churches. No collusion, James. No collusion. When this school of thought came to the realization that all its premises have been falsified, they should have reconsidered the status of the commonly received Greek, Latin, and Aramaic ecclesiastical texts, which should have led them back to Hort's natural presumption. But instead, modern text-critical theorists have continued mutating Holt's textual monstrosity to the tune of 28 editions of Nestle Alland. And things are going to get a whole lot worse, James. Supposedly, they have come out with some new machine, their take on AI. Are you talking about the CBGM? Precisely, James. Now off to the future! Welcome to Monster, home to the site of the Nestle Holland Greek New Testament text and the CBGM. <laughs> right this way, my friends. <laughs> Master, your guests have arrived. Thank you, Igor, for showing them in. Yes, Master. <laughs> Good evening, Stewie. James, what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? The pleasure is all mine, Dr. Gurry. Thanks for agreeing to meet with us on short notice. James, close your mouth. You're groveling. It's embarrassing. How can I be of assistance, Stewie? Well, Dr. Curry, James and I have been on our fact-finding mission, and we're trying to understand a little more about the CBGM. So, what exactly is the CBGM? Answering that, Stewie, will require everyone to get more acquainted with my published titles on the issue. But... Hold that thought, Dr. Gurry. Just a moment. Rupert, read through the chapters while we momentarily pause for a quick commercial break. Attention New Testament textual maniacs! Dr. Peter Gurry and Tommy Wasserman's book titled A New Approach to Textual Criticism is now available. Explore the first full-length, accessible introduction to the coherence-based genealogical method, which is now being used to establish the text of the Nestle Aland and the UBS Greek New Testament. Act now while the presses are hot. As you were saying, Dr. Gurry, before I rudely interrupted. In a relatively short sentence, the CBGM is a method that uses a set of computer tools based in a new way of relating manuscript texts that is designed to help us understand the origin and history of the New Testament text. Hmm, interesting, Dr. Gurry. Since programming of this kind relies heavily on algorithms, which are based on a set of assumptions, those assumptions would naturally drive the results, I'd be interested in hearing your views on the general consensus of scholars today on the Lucan recension theory. There wasn't one. Klaus Wachtel demonstrated this for the Catholic Epistles in his 1993 dissertation, and he has argued the same for Paul and the Gospels. I don't know many, any, living textual critic who thinks Lucian made a recession of the New Testament text. James, it's interesting that Bergen was right all along on this point, yet you don't follow his conclusion on the text. Hmm, strange. What do you have there, Rupert? Hmm, oh, I see. Excellent observation, Rupert. I'll be sure to let James know. Let me know? What? Well, Rupert has brought it to my attention that prior to the evolution of the CBGM, it appears modern text critics employed a different theory of relating manuscript text together to understand the origin and history of the text. Apparently, for the last two centuries, New Testament scholars used a concept known as text types, which categorized the text into Alexandrian, Western, Byzantine, or Caesarean type. If one reads Bruce Metzger's well-known textual commentary that accompanies the UBS, the notion of text types is absolutely essential to his explanation of the history of the New Testament text, and with it, to the practice of textual criticism itself. 
Hmm. I wonder how this jives with the CBGM. Let me ask Dr. Gurry. Dr. Gurry, how would the CBGM discern a type text if the text was Alexandrian or Western? First, text types are particular to certain parts of the New Testament. But for Acts and the Catholic letters, the CBGM does not offer strong support for an Alexandrian or Western text type as traditionally conceived. The reason is that the boundaries for these supposed text types turn out to be too porous in light of the complete collations used in the CBGM. It is one of the most significant conclusions drawn from use of the CBGM that text types are an unhelpful category for describing the history of the text and therefore are unhelpful for making textual decisions. Unhelpful for making textual decision, James? Ah, oh, my, oh, oh, right, right. Yes, well, that sort of changes everything. Especially since modern text critics' understanding of text types was central to reclassifying the Greek, Latin, and Aramaic ecclesiastical text as secondary in origin. Yet you're still holding on to the conclusion, James, as if it was spoken ex cathedra by the Pope. This is rich. <laughs> In other words, text types has been a phony baloney sandwich from the start, James. And modern text critics have been chewing on this sandwich for the last 200 years. <laughs> oh, right. oh, oh, goodness. Not you too, James. Oh, put down the phony baloney sandwich. No, don't drink the Kool-Aid too. Now, come on, James, I know all your textual theories are crumbling before you, but let's get a closer look at that machine. Hmm, it's kind of fascinating, James. I wonder what they feed this big guy. We feed it the oldest and best manuscripts. I wouldn't mind having a closer look at these so-called oldest and best manuscripts. Right this way, my friends. Where do these texts come from? Who knows? There seems to be a problem with the provenance, but they taste so good! <laughs> well, that explains all the lacuna in the manuscripts. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus! My precious! Snap out of it, James! These texts are fool's gold! But, Stewie, these texts were used by the churches. Excuse me, James, but there is a problem with the provenance of these texts. The origins of both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus remain elusive, despite generations of scholarly debate seeking to clarify and resolve the problem. Don't you see, James? While Sinaiticus and Vaticanus may well be 4th century Greek texts, we don't know where they come from according to Dr. Wasserman. Yet, in the 4th century, we can establish the provenance of two official texts read publicly at apostolic churches in Antioch, Rome, and North Africa that we can objectively compare them to. As you can see, James, the Greek text preached on from Antioch by Chrysostom in 385 from the oldest surviving Greek church going back to the Apostles' Witnesses against your text, James. And Antioch is not your only problem. Incidentally, when we look west in the 4th century, it leads us to Jerome's Vulgate. But that's the Latin. Except, Jerome tells us in his prologue to the Gospels that his Latin translation was revised in comparison with only old Greek manuscripts, which makes the Vulgate another 4th century or earlier Greek witness against your texts. Furthermore, Augustine's letter to Jerome corroborates the Vulgate as a credible witness to the Greek scriptures when he affirms, We are in no small measure thankful to God for the work in which you have translated the Gospels from the original Greek, because in almost every passage we have found nothing to object to when we compared it with the Greek scriptures. Therefore, James, the hypothesis for these oldest and best manuscripts is falsified. Yet the CBGM machine is being fueled primarily by these texts of unknown provenance as the basis for its additions. So why would the Nestle Allen in the UBS continue to maintain their conclusions on the ecclesiastical texts even though all its premises have been falsified? Is it because when you move off these mixed texts and have to resolve the differences between the Vulgate, the Byzantium, and Peshitta, it leads us back to the TR? That is heresy, Stewie! 
Oh, but there's more, James. Given that the TR is in the public domain, it means it couldn't be copyrighted. And without the mixed texts, there's no need for new modern translations which would cripple the Nestle Alland and UBS Bible publishing industry. Jobs would be lost, and you wouldn't be considered experts any longer. No! I don't want to hear this! But worse of all, James, you wouldn't be able to dress up in a new version of the original inerrant text every year for Halloween. Ah! It's the great pumpkin James White! He's rising up out of the pumpkin patch! 